So here's another rematch for us. Arthur Conan Doyle, or as he would later be known, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The Marika Deep was a story published late in Conan Doyle's life. He wrote this in 1927. And at this point in time, he had certainly been through quite a bit. Sherlock Holmes was mostly behind him, although perhaps not according to his public. Certainly getting the royalties from us still, that's for sure. Oh yeah, yeah. Plenty of royalties. He was heavily into the spiritualism by this time, and this story was published in 1927-28 in the Strand magazine, and later on reproduced in the Saturday Evening Post. And there was a break in serialization, and the last two chapters came later. 1929. Was it 1929? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was under a different title, The Lord of the Dark Face. The Lord of the Dark Face, yes. So the original publication in the Strand, I believe, had illustrations by Tom Petty. No, not that Tom Petty. <laughs> Some of them made their way into the Gutenberg edition. There seem to be several different illustrated versions of this. Right, exactly, yeah. So, and I kind of see that working. I could see illustrations working quite well for this. So, before we get into this, yeah, I mean, we already kind of covered the early life of Conan Doyle, and I don't really see more need to go into it at this point. No. But what's really interesting to me is that this story, I mean, I, I don't see this as disparagement of Conan Doyle. Quite the opposite, maybe. But this story feels very, very much of its time. And even though it was published in The Strand and in the Saturday Evening Post in America, it really feels to me like a pulp story from like Weird Tales or something like that oh, from yeah. around the same time. Absolutely, yeah. Especially the second half. Yeah, like that. the second half, definitely. The first half, too, I mean, it's total Edgar Burroughs. Yeah, yeah. Like, absolutely. And the thing is, I don't know that one can say or even should say that Conan Doyle read any of those authors. I think that maybe he just had to be aware of the strain in popular fiction at that time, which was very, very much into the whole Lost Race thing. I mean, he even wrote a Lost World novel himself, The Lost World. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, back in 1912. Yeah. So he was one of the early ones, for sure, but, like, not that far behind him were... Yeah, Burroughs, and who wrote his first books that same year. Also, Abraham Merritt. And, of course, people like Lovecraft right. and Robert E. Howard. And so many more in the 20s who were purveying this, this lost race fiction. And you can argue that that was a trend that started... A long time before, I mean, The Coming Race is, of course, full of it. And, sure. You know, that one was published in the 1870s. She was 1880s, I think? Oh, she, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. 1880s sounds right, though. Yeah. So, I mean, this was definitely a thing that was very popular at this time. And it's just really interesting and goes to show, once again, that people who only know Arthur Conan Doyle from Sherlock Holmes... This man wrote a lot of stuff, and everything from historical novels to these, like, weird lost race stories, which yeah. we're going to get one of right now. And this couldn't be more different than Sherlock Holmes, so if that's what you're expecting when you're going into this, it's a much different ride. Yeah. I would say, I mean, I understand why the Holmes stories are such classics, and I, I get it, but there's just so much, there's so much other stuff that Absolutely. this man yeah. did. So, and I'm, I hope that one day Arthur Conan Doyle gets his renaissance in the way that he would like. Maybe not 100% for, I mean, there were two things that he really wanted to be known for. One was his spiritualist tendencies yes. and his interest in that. And the second was his historical novels, right? which he thought were his best work by yeah. far. And which we are not going to cover on Chrononauts, obviously. But No, but we will be coming back to him at least twice. So oh, yeah. look for that in the future. Definitely. So in the beginning, we are recounted of a steamship being lost in the fall of 1926. The Stratford, believed down with all hands. The Stratford was requisitioned by Dr. Marquette and fitted with certain modifications, believed to assist in deep sea exploration. 
The seeming purpose of the mission is to examine life in the deepest ocean, but Maricot seems to have other goals in mind. The story is divided up into several documents. Yeah, the way he does this is really cool. Yeah, for the most part. There's one or two instances where I'm not sure how well it worked, but for the most part it was good. And there's various documents like the letter written by crewman Cyrus Headley to his friend from Puerto de Luz, their last land stopover after leaving England. And he is shown by his friend Scanlon, Bill Scanlon, the American mechanic, who shows him this detachable room that's behind the laboratory in the ship. And Marikud then reveals that they're going to plunge to a hitherto unreached depth in this sort of trench in the ocean that he calls the Marika Deep, apparently named after him. Yeah, I mean, who else? <laughs> yes, <laughs> obviously. And, and is located several miles southwest of the Canary Islands. Then there's another piece of evidence, an incomprehensible wireless message that tells of doom. And this mysterious vitreous ball found by a Norwegian ship, I believe he said it was, in January 1927 at 27.1428 degrees west, containing another message, and the ball is made of a strange light transparent material and very tough, very difficult to break, but when they do, the ball itself dissolves, revealing the piece of paper inside that contains another message from Mr. Headley, and it is the account of Marikut Headley and Bill Scanlon going down in the bathosphere chamber of whatever you want to call it. And they reach a depth of 1,500 feet, and they have a tube to bring air from above and an emergency supply of air if it's needed, and electric floodlights. This is one interesting bit, I think, because Doyle makes a point to say that scientists are, like, totally wrong about pressure under the ocean and that it's just really no big deal at all to dive super far down and you really yeah. don't have to worry about it. <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, I think, Conan Doyle's a very likable personality. And I mean, you know, there's this biography that I mentioned in the bonus episode that I actually, I'm not much of a reader of biographies as a general rule. It's not something that really gets me going most right. of the time. But I enjoyed reading this because it was really insight, interesting insight into him and his personality. But he definitely had these weird things that he latched onto yeah, and believed absolutely. in. And yeah, like saying he was very interested in science, but some of his ideas about science were definitely strange. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to say the least. Yeah. The ship, which is sort of towing them along at the bottom, they're sort of attached by a wire. And the ship sort of tows them forward to approach this chasm that's the Marico Deep that leads supposedly into this gigantic deep hole in the ocean, I guess, that goes like thousands of feet under sea level. Yeah. And it is a nightmarish gulf into the unknown dark depths. And suddenly, of course, what should happen but a giant crustacean comes out of the gulf and starts to investigate the chamber and very quickly breaks the hauser line connecting them to the ship. So that was easy. Just like that, they're severed from all hope. And Maricut's like, well, we better make our peace with the creator now. And they all pretty much agree that's what they had to do. So, yep. yeah, I mean, it was very quick that they decided they, they were going to join him, and they just did. And I guess they're, like, sound patriotic men, and they don't shirk their duty. So instead of panicking, they're just like, oh, okay, well, I guess we did our part for science exploration. That's good. But then all of a sudden, they hit the bottom of an oozy seafloor with a very soft thump. They are now 26,000 feet down. And they see what looks like carvings and inscriptions and perhaps the tops of buried, long buried buildings. Yeah, it appears like lots of stuff on the sea floor is luminous, so they yeah. can actually see, and it's not pitch black. 
down at the very bottom like it would be. Yeah, the marine life, the sub-aquatic marine life itself is luminous. Yeah. There's a very strange, like, this, these all these undersea landscapes, like, they're kind of like Vern, but they're more Lovecraftian. Yeah, almost. like you said at the beginning, this feels very weird tales to me. Like, the whole description of the ocean floor, the ocean life, and what they find in a little bit, especially what they find in the second half. Yeah, very much along that Weird Tales kind of vibe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very much so. so it's very interesting seeing Arthur Conan Doyle have this kind of yeah. stuff, too. So the writing looks vaguely related to ancient Phoenician, says Marikut, who happens to be an expert in such things as well. The air is full of carbon dioxide in the chamber now, and they're starting to pass out. Scanlon, in fact, doesn't make it, and the others are not far behind, but Headley sees a face peering at them. Yes, there are people down there wearing deep water suits, and they seem quite friendly, and they tell the maricotters to open their trap door, and since they'll either drown or suffocate anyway, they do, and they're passed in suits and breathing apparatus, and they put them on. And Headley manages to get his handkerchief up the line to the surface. So that doesn't really do anything but make them really puzzled. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> like, no, what happened? And they enter a chamber and there are a lot of people milling about happily. And their hosts offer them food and beds. And they go to sleep and they have a long and relieving nap. And it's a morning meal and it's really good. And the professor says... The honey is synthetic, but he wonders about the coffee and the flour and so on. They seem to have everything. And these people, who they already started to call Atlanteans, are able to extract necessary elements from their environments to synthesize things. And they are brought a screen to project mental pictures onto, yeah. which is a really cool device yeah, that device reminds me awesome. of something out of a Doctor Who story. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And... Marika telepaths to their house about the surface and where they came from and they're brought to this huge assembly and it's kind of cool like the people around them watch the adventures that they had and they're sort of very like sympathetic and welcoming and yeah. the like this they, huge like, lecture get really hall. Yeah, like they get really involved in their plight, and it's, yeah. it's like having the perfect audience almost. Right, right. So it's, a, it's really cool. And they're shown the mechanisms that keep the city or whatever it is running, and the inhabitants seem to have great technology, but it all seems to have been put there like long before they or their descendants arrived. And they don't seem to have a lot of initiative or real understanding even perhaps of how it works. Yeah. And they are entranced by Scanlan's mouth organ and the music that he plays. They really <laughs> love that. And we got some unfortunate racist language in this book, uh, yeah. by the way. So yeah, we do. Content warning. It's thoughtless rather than like malicious, but it's there. Yeah, so, Scanlan's character is like this loud-talking American guy with all these at the time would be like cool expressions. Yeah. And he does say racist stuff. Yeah, and in the end, in the end too, we see that he's actually like he. We'll get into this shortly, but there is a slave race in this story, and he is he seems to be like justifiably against the fact that there are slave race, right? But he still uses the language that would have been acceptable, right, among his people and of that time. Yeah. So be ready for that if you read this; it's there. But again, I don't think it's malicious. I think it's more just yeah, thoughtless. You know, it's it's. it's yeah. So he plays on his mouth organ, and it's kind of like 1920s jazz kind of thing, I guess. And the native Atlanteans are really into that. They're pretty much welcomed and shown everywhere. But, of course, there's this one corridor that they're not really supposed to go down. And that naturally means that they're going to. And, <laughs> yes, because as you will, right? You, know, you want to see what's behind, what what is the secret, what is hidden. It is a temple of Moloch, or Baal, and they are not welcome. And the priests are angry, and so is their chief, Manda, who has been sort of befriending them. Yeah. Totally coincidental, that is the same name the monster has in Atragon. Really? Yeah. Ah, yeah. That's an interesting coincidence. <laughs> ah. 
But it's not too bad. I mean, they get over it. And they also find that there's a shrine to Athena. And it seems that, indeed, these people may be related in some way to the ancient Phoenicians. And they perhaps took Greek slaves at some points. And so the slave race are actually the lighter skinned, sort of more, I guess, Mediterranean looking people. And the Atlanteans are more like dark skinned. So, and they run the show. Right. So life isn't so bad, but they do miss their homelands. Headley has sort of fallen in love with this um, woman called Mona, who is the daughter of Manda, the chief. It's always a bad idea. Yeah, but it turns out all right. Yeah. Like, everything in this book turns out all right. Like, even a lot of the things that normally in these sorts of stories would, like, cause problems don't seem yeah. to. Yeah, yeah. So it's interesting because I said that this story was very reminiscent of a style of fiction that was prevalent at that time. But in other ways, it's sort of like it does sort of ignore a few of the tropes, I think. Right. I'm not sure if this makes the story better necessarily, but it just makes it interesting in a standout way, I guess. Because, like, here they are showing each other everything. Like, the three travelers are showing the Atlanteans everything, and then, like, obviously, they escape, and they talk about the Atlanteans, and, like, there's sort of this cross-communication that you think would have negative consequences, and it actually doesn't. Yeah. So, I don't know. That's sort of interesting. There's another journey under the sea, kind of reminiscent of 20,000 Leagues, actually. Right. And they visit the old bathysphere chamber, and they hunt some flatfish, and they go to an underwater coal mine with slaves. And, again, they're the ones descended from the ancient Greek prisoners. Yeah, they still speak and, Greek. Yeah, yeah. And Maricot faces tiger crabs, which are huge, monstrous things. And they go on further, and they enter the sunken ancient city of the lost Atlanteans, who are the ones that didn't survive. And they've fallen in uh, moments of decadent splendor and sea life has taken over the thrones and there's giant squids on the divans and the whole history of Atlantis is revealed. And there are the decadents who just want to continue on in states of depravity and the reformers and the reformers are getting tired of waiting and they decide to do something about it. So they build the redoubt and I guess they decide that they need to hide a few of the wisest Atlanteans and perhaps the most agile and able, and they do. And the great cities sink under the waves under a calamity that we have yet to have fully described, but it will sort of come. They find the wreck of the Stratford as well, and it seems like it went into the chasm and smashed. So that's too bad. And there's all kinds of descriptions of really, really wild undersea life with nearly mythological proportions. And meanwhile, Scanlon has been showing the engineer, Bearbrix, all this cool stuff that he knows, like how to pick up radio signals from on the surface. Yeah, they build a working wireless receiver. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. They they can't transmit. Yeah. He apparently doesn't have the expertise to build a transmitter, but he can build a receiver and they pick up London broadcasting. We get the London calling. London yeah. calling. Right. Uh, it's pretty cool. So, yeah, during the 20s, radio kits were sold to kids as like hobbyist things, and it was very easy to put together a basic receiver. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting how simple the circuit is. And Scanlon is a mechanic. So yeah, right, it almost exactly. surprised me that he couldn't also build a transmitter, but yeah. in the end, it doesn't really need one, so I guess it's okay. But it's just like, it seems like he'd maybe be able to do that. But they pick up the radio, and the, the people of Atlantis are just in awe of this. They love it so much. Right. Especially when the marching music starts, like they really get into it. I mean, it's really fun. Like he's kind of depicting them as these sort of simple noble savages i guess almost mm -hmm. like they have all this technology but they don't quite know where it comes from they kind of know how to maintain it but they don't have real engineers among them or anything like that i guess so marikud has discovered that the atlanteans have knowledge of this gas which he calls levagen and it's like 
thousands of times lighter than hydrogen somehow. So it's like really buoyant and they're planning a return to the surface. But Henley is oddly reluctant because he's probably thinking about Mona. And we get this segue into this yacht Marion, which is led by Key Osborne going to investigate and rescue them because they've been getting the messages that have been sent back and forth. And there's wireless messages and bottles on lines that the Marion has to find. And finally, they send up their vitreous bulls, balls from under the ocean. And at first they just contain messages, but then they send up larger ones, which are like kind of linked together. And they're in done in order to send up the explorers. And the first one they send up is Mona, which seems strange. Why would they do that? I don't know. But <laughs> So first thing they see is this Atlantean babe coming out of the ocean. And of course they're all very impressed. And the ball rides sound pretty fun, except you sort of fall unconscious because of all the, maybe all the pressure changes, I guess. Right. They like shoot up out of the depths and then 30 feet into the air before splashing back down into the water. And it sounds fun, but yeah, you lose consciousness on the way, I guess. So the first thing Scanlon does is go to the bar, and Maracut goes to his figures, and Headley to his woman. And that is the end of the first part, but then we get two more chapters that are sort of thrown in at the end that were written much later. Yeah. Well, not much later, but a few months later. Yeah, and the Gutenberg edition doesn't make it clear that there was a essentially a sequel, and I thought it was like chapters of the same work so i was like wait that's an odd way to end it at this point and then you have two more chapters after where it made more sense as a sequel than part of the same work. yeah except it's not a sequel because it takes place before they leave well yeah you know what i mean <laughs> so uh, yeah no i, I do a but continuation I'm, I'm just saying, like, in some way yeah i mean it yeah I'm, I'm just saying like it could have ended at the same place right but those chapters could have come first yeah yeah you know right what I mean? exactly yeah Yep. Like, it didn't make sense that they were chapter six and seven. Like, I don't mind a story that jumps around in time. I think that's cool. But there was not really any need for this, too. It's just like he thought of this afterwards and wanted to include it. And Well, yeah, that's I'm sure exactly what happened. Yeah, he probably thought of it after he published the first one and be like, oh, I'd rather do an extra thing of when they were down there rather than continue the narrative of what happens when they get. Yeah. Because, I mean, that would be something you would question. You would be like, well, what happened then? Like, now yeah. the Atlanteans are not innocent anymore. Right? Yeah. Now, instead, we go back, and the narrative is once again picked up by Headley, who describes some of the less savory creatures of the deep, which is not something we've really seen before. No. There's all kinds of dangerous things. There's gaseous organic clouds that wither their prey and possibly steal their eyes. And there's a giant sea slug that emits electric waves of death that pretty much kill at a distance of many meters. And there's the Hydrops ferox, which is a small fish that swarms in like numbers of tens of thousands yeah. to any sight or smell of blood and just completely tears their prey to pieces. A deep sea piranha. Yeah. And there's vast and sudden sea storms or tornadoes possibly emerging from some volcanic gulfs. And Manda shows Headley some screen visions, and Mona's there too, and it's a kind of a race memory. And all this has happened before. All of them are recurring, including the visitors. So again, I think this is tying into Conan Doyle's sort of spiritualist oh, tendencies, absolutely. where yeah. he's like, yeah, he's a concepts of reincarnation and yeah. like he doesn't really play too much with this in the first part but he no lays it on pretty thick here it's and really here yeah. yeah yeah and i can't say i mind i i really enjoyed the second part of this a lot it has a much I different tone it. than the I, first but um it yeah. really worked for me it worked but i thought it was it was well we'll get we'll get to it but yeah so he says it's it's showing that it's destiny and he wants mona and henley to be together because I guess in the past, his ancient ancestor had the chance to endorse the union between, I guess, his daughter and some, like, representative of another 
clan or civilization. Yeah. And he, like, instead responded in anger and hatred. And now he feels like it's time to turn that stone over and be the better man, I guess. Yeah. I, I think that's what I got from that, anyway. No, for sure, yeah. I mean, it's it's fairly graphic. I mean, they're all represented in the same physical form, but he is in love with the daughter and has said the father just kills him. Yeah, yeah. And then we hear another incident where Berbrix, who's Scanlon's friend, he comes with his Greek-descended wife and a baby, and we hear about the Temple of Baal priests, which sort of were this dark side of the culture that was sort of swept under the rug in the last part. Yeah. They didn't really face any real consequences from visiting the the temple. Like, I thought that they would be, if this followed the normal tropes, they would have been like, now you must be sacrificed. You have seen what you cannot see. Right, and, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But none of that happened. Yeah. But it turns out that the temple priests, in fact, are really not fans of miscegenation, and they do not want this baby to survive. And Manda is very patiently explaining to the visitors that if there was too much interbreeding, they wouldn't be able to tell the difference between them and the slave race. And this would be a huge problem, right? Yeah. So yeah, the priest is really into sacrificing the baby, but Manda has to mediate, and it seems like he's making some progress. Mona is supposed to take charge of the baby, which is sort of funny because I just realized like Mona disappears a little bit later. Yeah, right. So I'm not sure what happened to the baby, actually. I don't think they send the baby up. No, they don't send the baby up. So, yeah. So, Arthur, what did you do with the baby? <laughs> anyway, in the very last chapter, we get this very weird thing that happens. So there's this other place they're not really supposed to go. And it's this other temple i guess and he has alluded in the past chapter to this lord of the dark face but we don't know what it is maricot thinks it's elevated man or near god known for terrible wickedness and depravity and the black arts and it's like i guess in the area where the sunken city is yeah the ancient city yeah so they need to wear their diving suits to get to it and it's a sunken temple that Scanlon and Headley and Maricot are just determined to visit because yeah. mostly Scanlon. He's just like, hey, uh, I want to know what this weird thing is. So they go inside. This temple's awesome, too. Like, the, the way yeah, it's described, like, like he, he does a really good job of this. Yeah, there's, like, horrible sea creatures living everywhere and terrible artworks, like, all over the walls. And he describes it as... Sadistic cruelty and bestial lust. So yeah. there's your title for your Bathory tribute band, <laughs> right? Song or album? There's a terrible Medusa head right above the main doorway. Yeah, it's definitely very like it's again very much of those sort of Lovecraft, Clark Ashton Smith like yeah. underground temples where strange and terrible things happen. And before them is this terrible Baal-like statue. But while they're looking at it, they hear mocking laughter behind them, and they turn around, and there's this, like, strong-visaged humanoid figure that looks like, I guess, like a bronze demigod. Yeah. And he's just, like, youthful and terrible and strong, and he conveys this sense of unbeatable power, and he introduces himself as Baal Sipa, and he taunts them, and he says... In English. In English, yes. And he's been living on Earth as a man for 12,000 years and has wreaked havoc in the world. And he describes these various terrible wars and revolutions in human history and says that he's the man who's standing there making the crowd do his bidding and he is the master of the mob. And he says that he had nearly forgotten about the Atlantean colony until the three intruders reminded him. And it's just so quick the way, like, normally there has to be some kind of ceremony or thing to wake up the ancient demigod. But here, they all they have to do is walk in. Yeah. And he's like, oh, I this forgot thing. about yeah. you. <laughs> so, yeah. And now he decides the Atlanteans will pay. And... He gives a scroll to be delivered to Manda, and he says he will see them again, and vanishes. And 
they're on quite a state and instead of questioning anything i guess maybe they're like sort of being directed at this point they just give the message right to amanda and i thought like oh it's gonna be a death note or something but no he just he doesn't like burst into flames or anything but he's justifiably quite horrified and upset and he yeah. summons the council um, he doesn't reproach his guests at all though surprisingly maybe he understands that they're not working under their own power because indeed when scanlon pulls a gun he's like why don't we just shoot the bastard? We can blow some holes in Bayo Sipa. But then he's struck down by this terrible agony and passes out like immediately. And the Dark Lord Bayo Sipa has already shown up in the council chamber and he dominates the crowd and condemns them. But Maricot has gone off to pray as it turns out. Something very unusual for him. He never does that because he's a self-admitted materialist but he really doesn't know what else to do. And he comes back as an elevated being himself. And through his will, but also the will of the spirit that he has contacted, which is apparently this being called Warda, who first perhaps imprisoned Baal Sipa in some kind of immortality. I don't know. It's yeah. not clear exactly. Because, like, Baal Sipa doesn't seem to like living. No. But he has the freedom to roam around the earth and do whatever he wants. So, I don't know. It's interesting because here I see, like, a blueprint for so many, like, of these kinds of cursed demigod type characters. Right. But it's not really gone into a lot. So. No, both parts of this are pretty short. Yeah. So, Baal Sipa is overcome and he collapses slowly into a mound of putrescence, like, the body of Monsieur Valdemar in the post story. It's pretty yeah, awesome. It is. <laughs> so for a moment, Maricot was all powerful. And so then I guess we go to Mona and the three going back to the surface. Fate of mixed race baby unknown. Right. But so that's the story. This was really interesting, and I did think that the last chapter was the most, like, oh, this reminds me of so much other stuff that I like, but it was too short. Like, it was just not, it wasn't really gone into enough yeah. for me to really feel it the way I think that it is. Like, that could have been an entire novel. No, I agree. Yeah. And I wish it was. I mean, <laughs> yeah, some of his descriptions here are, like, of the temple, of the ball in, I guess, slick talking demon form as well as this yeah. like bizarre spiritualist multi-millennial showdown between these two entities who have always been at war with one another it's really cool and very weird strange vibes in the pro style and doyle's really good at writing and conveying those kind of images i think yeah definitely I, I agree with all that. I just wish it wasn't so compressed, but... It does feel very compressed, yeah. It could have been, like, two separate novels, like, entirely. And it could have been two nicely joined-together stories, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. He could have put so much more into this Baal Sipa kind of concept and the, the whole eternal recurrence kind of thing. What would have been cool, I think, would have been if Marikut was, like... Because he's a pretty cool character, like he's, out of all the stories, I think this was the one with the characters that were most, like, I'm not going to say they were well-drawn, like they're three-dimensional per se, but they were, like, 
they had conversations that you could actually picture people having. Right. What would have been cool would have been if Manda tried to show like them, especially Maricot, all this stuff. And Maricot didn't believe because he's this like hardcore materialist, right? And he doesn't believe in any of this right. yeah, you know, yeah. cyclical soul transfer stuff. Like yeah. he thinks it's all nonsense. But then as he like meets Baal Sipa and as things start to change he eventually comes to accept this warda and then comes to embody the spirit. Like, that would have been a really cool way of doing this. It just felt... It felt so rushed. Like, yeah, it I, happens I quickly. <laughs> like, this was the shortest of the three works. And to me, like, this was the one that deserved to be longer out of all of them. So, yeah. I mean, I'm not saying it needed to be as long as 20k leagues, but... No, and in fact, there's... One line at the beginning, which I kind of wonder if it's a direct reference to 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, where he is talking, I think, in the initial letter from Head. So on the deck, they're doing some fishing, and he says, I won't bore you with all the brotolids and macros oh, yeah. and all that other stuff. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's funny that he does that. Maybe it is a reference. I really don't know. I mean, later on, when they go down in the Atlantean diving suits and wander yeah. and hunt. Like, there is a bit of that. Yeah, but not a terrible deal. Yeah, like, it's just enough not to be too much. Like, it's for one or two chapters. Like, right. we get a lot of that, and yeah. then that's it. So, I have to say, like, the the descriptions of the, like, horrible, weird forms of life that they come against in, like, the, the seventh chapter. Yeah. Before they meet the Lord of the Dark Face. Like, yeah, that's like really cool, Yeah, like the sea cool slug too. and stuff. Like, yeah, the monsters are pretty The awesome. monsters are pretty wicked, yeah. yeah. And they remind me of, like, stuff like William Hope Hodgson's The Nightland, where, you know, yeah. it's, like, far, far in the future, and he's describing, like, it's a really frustrating book to read, but he definitely <laughs> describes some very strange and horrible monsters yeah. that are like, wow, I mean, that's you wouldn't want to come up against no. any of those things. Yeah. <laughs> and here it's more physical, like, in, in the... The Hodgson, they actually get into your mind and your soul and stuff, which is yeah. like the Lord of the Dark Face does that, I guess. But yeah. yeah, and then that last chapter just comes at you and it's like, whoa, Atlantean, like buried Atlantean evil god. Like, yeah. That's, I wasn't expecting it to go there either. No, I wasn't. Yeah. Like I thought it might have early on because that often these kind of stories do have that. Like that is a trope. Yeah, it definitely is. But it's introduced so late in the game and it's so like... It's well done, but it's so quick that I, I wanted more because I like that trope, I guess. And I just, like, I wanted to have Baal Sipa, like, stomping around a little more, like, doing stuff, maybe. And, yeah. I don't know, like like I mentioned, the the struggle, perhaps, of Marika coming to terms with the idea of these spiritual things. Right. Um, I mean, the idea of spiritualism and science is certainly one that was very close to Doyle and one that he was very familiar with and i'm sure he got mocked a lot for his oh, beliefs did, yeah. in spiritualism which at that time were very out of vogue yeah he he definitely constantly dealt with that by the yeah. sound of it and it's easy to sort of mock his beliefs a little bit but i think it's also easy knowing how good he was at what he did and his writing right. and stuff to feel like bad for him yeah i mean i don't know read what he had to say just listen don't think of him just as the Sherlock Holmes guy. Because that's, that's not fair. No, he has so much more than that. Yeah. And again, not to put down Sherlock Holmes, I totally understand if you think that Sherlock Holmes is, like, better than this. But even then, there's more. Like, there are all the historical works. Yeah. There's his volumes on spiritualism, which are actually interesting to read. They're great, yeah. And there's tons and tons of adventure stories and mystery, like various kinds of mysteries and sea stories and stuff. So, yeah, he was a, a full-time, long-term writer, much like H.G. Wells. He never stopped. So, read more Doyle. Read yeah. different Doyle. <laughs> There's a very good Arthur Conan Doyle encyclopedia online that has yeah. a lot of comprehensive information on pretty much everything he wrote, fiction and nonfiction. And we're going to be coming back to a couple of his works on the podcast later. But I've certainly enjoyed everything we've read by him so far, both, again, the fiction and the nonfiction. Yeah, and I think everything is on that site. Like, it's kind of like a 
the format is sort of like a wiki page. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. and it's pretty much got everything that he wrote uh, yeah. linked from there. So the main page takes a really long time to load. But when you're, you know, you're there and you can just go alphabetically or chronologically and search pretty much every every piece of Conan Doyle work. So the people that put it together obviously do care about the stuff that he did. I mean, you can find a lot of it at Gutenberg and stuff too, but yeah. just the way that it's organized, the site and stuff is pretty cool if you are interested in him and, and what he did. Yeah, Maricot Deep is on Gutenberg. It's on Gutenberg, Australia, so I think the copyright limit in Australia is 29. So he died in 30, and I'm assuming everything he... So this was really, really near the end then. Yeah, yeah okay. the second part of this was the second to last story that he had published in his lifetime. There were a couple pieces of fiction and nonfiction that were published afterwards, but the only other piece of fiction that was published in his lifetime after this was named... The Death Voyage. Yes, The Death Voyage. <laughs> yeah, kind of want to know what that's about now. Right, rather he's ominous. Got, he's got that song, that, that the album song black metal titles down there. With yeah, exactly. <laughs> bestial Lust and Cruelty and... Right. Or Sadistic Cruelty and The Death Voyage. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, and it's interesting too because a lot of the writers that, that were... that I mentioned earlier, like they were a lot younger than... Doyle, obviously, and Doyle had been around for a long time by this point, and he obviously yeah. picked up on this this strain of fiction, I guess, and, like, this was published in some major magazines. Like, I yeah. mean, Weird Tales was, at the time, yeah, it had its popularity and stuff, but, I mean, obviously, it's nothing like the Saturday Evening Post or right. The Strand, I think, so. Yeah. And it was also know. translated into... Russian, French, and German in 1929, which I don't think is something that most of those weird tale no. authors enjoyed. No, I mean, I'm sure Lovecraft has it now, but... Yeah, uh, yeah. Not, not in the 20s. No, definitely not. Yeah. Um, so that's interesting. I mean, I don't think that this was necessarily, like, an exemplar of that kind of thing. I mean, I, I still personally think that Abraham Merritt is one of the best writers of that kind of fiction. Like, I just think he does it so well. Yeah. Well, we'll definitely have to work him in on the podcast. Then. Yeah, we have to work him in on a podcast for sure. He's so good. Like, very pulpy, but like all the Lost Race stuff and all the, the things that are gone into and the weird rivalries and the decadent, like, decadent depravities and the whole thing with the rising evil demigods and stuff like right. he just he he mastered that whole thing and yeah. took it by the balls like yeah. i i don't know what we're gonna do on the podcast but there's gonna be some abraham Merritt coming up for sure i can't hold off on it for too much longer <laughs> after her doing this so yeah yeah and we did again other things that were kind of reminiscent of that like the dls nixon story yeah right right and there were a couple one or two other things as well where i, I kind of brought this up but our Weird Tales episodes are definitely coming up, and we're going to be talking about that kind of stuff yeah. at a future time. Yeah. But I think we both really like this. This was uh, a nice break from two books that were sort of difficult for two different reasons. I mean, right. maybe the Undersea Worship wasn't difficult, but it was just like, it was pretty short, but it was, I didn't really enjoy the second half very much, so this was a nice, like, it felt like being in comfortable territory for me a little bit. Yeah, and absolutely. Maybe that sounds like faint praise, but it's actually not. <laughs> like it's just, it worked in a way that like, ever since I was a kid, reading these kind of stories about like you mentioned the Empire of Mu, like right. It definitely has a lot of more similarities to the second half of this work than it did with Undersea Warship. You know, aside from the ship. And I mean, it just reminds me of like, uh, what's it called? This book that I read when I was a kid, like Operation Atlantis or something like that. I right. think it's by Andre Norton. And really similar kind of things, but in a like a early sixties milieu, right? So it's a bit more obviously sexy, I guess, in some parts, and a bit more <laughs> right. like but Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this this thing carries on for a bit. You see reminiscences in a lot of, of sword and sorcery and that's kind of that stuff that I really like the Fritz Leiber, Fafford and the Gray Mouser stories and stuff like that. Like I just that's we're probably not going to do those on the podcast because they're a lot more fantasy, but like they still verge into this territory a lot. So yeah, 
we do actually believe in opening things up and adopting a very loose definition of what this genre is. Yeah, and especially with the early years, like I said earlier, all the stuff before World War II really hasn't congealed into a solid genre yet, where publishers are marketing things a certain way and readers are expecting a certain thing from the authors. There's a lot more of the lines blurred, and I think we're going to talk about this more in an upcoming bonus episode, but the differences between science fiction and fantasy from this era, the 20s and before, really isn't as pronounced as one might think, especially in the modern publishing landscape. No, and I, I definitely think that for a long time now, I've actually appreciated the the melding of the two ideals. Like, yeah. I mean, they don't have to be so different, and that's why I always liked the sword and sorcery stuff, but also people like Michael Moorcock, who can sometimes, it'll be like fantasy, fantasy, but then all of a sudden he'll throw in like, some alien from a foreign star or he'll right. throw in like a sword that has a jewel in it that's like this unbeatable like powerful power source or something like yeah, that that's, yeah it's like oh that's it seems like a scientific concept expressed by by an, an ancient civilization or something right. and that's right pretty awesome to envisage that kind of thing for some of us like that cauldron born demo said it's sword sorcery and science yeah <laughs> So, American Deep, very good stuff. Yeah, I liked it a lot. Pretty much wraps us up for this edition of Chrononauts Under the Sea. We hope you enjoyed plowing through the subterranean depths. And I'm going to just run down what we have coming up. We have designed an episode around mathematical fiction. So yeah. we have some short works, mostly short works, dealing with concepts of mathematics, we think. We haven't really read through them yet but we will and we suggest that you do too all of these are readily available on the internet including one that we will be putting on the blog spot in fact as they're now and the works that we will be covering from the most famous which is edwin abbott's flatland published in 1884 and we will also be doing edward page mitchell's the tacky pump published in 1873 you may remember we covered The Clock That Went Backwards by Edward Page Mitchell some time ago, almost an entire year ago, in fact. Yeah. And we really liked that story. It was an amazing story. So we did do his little piece, Under the Earth, which was fun, but not really that substantial, I guess. Yeah. I'm definitely excited to read this one. Yeah, I will say that uh, I've already read this one, and I like it quite cool. a bit. So yeah, well, I'm looking forward to good. it. But it's quite a short one, as are most of the other ones. We're yeah. also doing Mary E. Wilkins, An Old Arithmetician, published in 1885. We also have Elizabeth Wormley Latimer's The Sirdar's Chessboard, which will be available on the block spot. Yeah, it's up there now. It was originally published yes. in a issue of Harper's and was only previously available in un ocr form and some Difficult to find 900-page PDFs, so I figured yeah. I corrected the text and, and post it just for convenience here. So you can read that there, and it'll probably be the best place you can read this story on the internet. Yeah. There's also Henry A. Herring's Silas P. Cornu's Dry Calculator from 1898. And Nikolai Georgievich. Garin Mikhailovsky's The Genius, published in 1901. And finally, we have Elements of Pataphysics, published in 1911, written by Alfred Jerry. And it may sound like a lot of works, but most of them are very short. Very short. So what we will do is try to provide links to all of them. I'm pretty sure they're all really easily available, yeah. including Pataphysics. Which, by the way, if you happen to have the big book of science fiction, of course, that story is in there. So that is a nice modern source for that work in a print book. So, yeah, that'll be in another four weeks. And I know I'm looking forward to it. it yeah, may it'll be, be a fun a, episode. Yeah, it'll be a bit of a more nebulous sort of theme than the last few ones that we've been covering. Yeah, definitely. But we are definitely going to kind of covering a few more themes, but eventually our aim is to sort of 
move away from that territory just a little bit or be maybe a little more broad and creative with the themes because all these major developments in the science of the 19th and early 20th century will sort of be established. Mm -hmm. So we have one coming up on the Telegraph. We have one coming up on Antarctic Exploration. And we have stuff coming up on body modifications and so forth. So I think it'll be an interesting several months ahead. Definitely. And of course, we welcome anyone's feedback and thoughts. You can write us at uh, any number of the places that we listed early in the podcast. And yes, remember to replenish your air supply every several hours, lest you pass out from oxygen starvation. And of course, beware the undersea temples, because you don't know what you might awaken. This is JM and Nate. We have been Chrononauts. Good night, everybody. See you next time.